All right, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Acts chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I am a common, normal, maybe average, standard, typical, um, just a regular Christian guy um, who has the great privilege of preaching the gospel of Jesus. And um, I am a simple preacher who does not have all the answers. And, and I want you to know I am very, very comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with who I am. And it, it, it hasn't always been that way. Um, there was a time um, early in ministry um, where my goal was to be anything but a simple preacher. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to be the smartest um, the one with the most wisdom, um, with the best out of lines. I mean, I, I wanted to be the very best. And I remember the first sermon I ever preached, and I, I was excited about it, and I probably prepared for a month working on the outline, I mean, making sure that it was well alliterated, I mean, making it perfect. And um, I worked very hard getting ready. And I preached from Matthew chapter 25. It's the only sermon I've ever preached in my whole life I can remember what it was about. Um, but I preached from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And this has been like 100 years ago. And, and I remember it like it was yesterday. That little section of Scripture is about the ten virgins. It's about the end times. But I, I was... I was just so very, very excited, and so I got up, and I preached, and when I was done, <clears throat> when I was done, and we preachers, we kind of evaluate ourselves, and I thought to myself, that was okay, you know, it wasn't the worst I've ever heard, you know, and, you know, trying to evaluate myself, and um, trying to just figure out, you know, praying I did an okay job, and um, then, then, the preacher of the church where I was preaching, he stood up and he goes, now that was a simple sermon. And I was a fit, big boy. What do you mean simple sermon? <laughs> he said it was a simple, and, and we don't think he meant anything by it, right? It was, it was a compliment. It probably was. I don't know. But he said it was just like a simple sermon. And But there was something in me. I mean, that drove me. Because I didn't want to be a simple preacher. And and, and when, when I stood up and preached, I didn't want someone to say, well, that's just a simple, average, normal, ordinary little sermon. I thought I needed to be better than that if God was going to use me. I couldn't be ordinary because everybody's ordinary. I needed to be something better than ordinary for God to use me. And all the preachers I knew, they were far better than ordinary. They were outstanding preachers. And, and so, I mean, I worked hard for years trying to be something that I really wasn't. I mean, I, I, I took every seminary course you could take. I remember one time I took a seminary course. It was called Preaching to a Multi-Generational Congregation. I didn't learn a thing. <laughs> I don't even know what it was about anymore other than the title. Because I was trying to be something better than simple. Something other than simple. But as time went on, I grew tired of the work. And you may understand this. I grew tired of the work of trying to be something that I'm not. Something more than what I really was. And so 
Then it, it, it came to me, I can't remember if it was on a Sunday, I don't even remember what day this actually happened, but it came to me one day, as it, I'm sure maybe it has to some of you at some time in your life, it came to me and I decided I was just going to be me. What, whatever that was, I was just going to be me and serve God just being me. And, and, and not try to be anything other than me. And that set me free. It, it, it just set me free as, as simple and ordinary and typical and common and average as I am. I am comfortable just being me. And so, and so if you are here today... And you're kind of a normal person, an ordinary person, just a simple person, just an average person. And maybe, maybe this passage that we're going to read will be an, an encouragement to you. And I, I, do, I absolutely love this passage. Um, it is out of Acts chapter 4. And um, I'll start reading in verse 1. Um, I said we're going through 22. I hope we can get that far, but I kind of doubt we will. But we will certainly try. Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this. Now, as they spoke to the people, this is Peter and John speaking to the people at the temple, and, and they are telling these people um, how they can be saved. And so, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the guard, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, my translation reads like that maybe... Um, the, the priest and the captain of the guard and the Sadducees were just walking by and they happened upon um, Peter and John. And that, that may be how it happened, but, but I think more likely than not, word had gotten back to the Sadducees, to the priest, to the captain of the guard, that Peter and John, they're out there talking about Jesus again, you know. And, and so I think these people purposely went to confront Peter and John. Either way, I guess it really doesn't matter, verse 2, being greatly disturbed. And, and, and these folks, they just seem to be disturbed all the time. And you may know folks like that. I mean, everything disturbs them. Nothing was ever right. They, they, were, they, they were always bothered by something, always worried by something, and, and, and so here, and this is mostly, mostly the Sadducees here are greatly disturbed. And here's why. That they, that Peter and John, that they taught the people and preached in Jesus, and this is what bothered the Sadducees, <laughs> the resurrection from the dead. You see, the Sadducees, they didn't care for Jesus at all. They, they felt threatened by him. They were always asking those trick questions. And I, I hate trick questions. I mean, they, they, they were always asking Jesus these trick questions. And their purpose was to get him to try to break the law of God. And, and so they would ask him those questions that are really impossible to answer. <laughs> but he could answer them. You know, but it, it, it was always these trick questions to try to trick him into breaking the law. And it was also so that they could prove to everybody, we're smarter than Jesus. We are, we are really smart people. But, but it always backfired on them. So the, the Sadducees, they, they are this group of people, these mostly leaders who did not believe in the resurrection. And, and so when they heard Peter and John, they're out there preaching Jesus and they're preaching that because of Jesus there's resurrection from the dead, they're greatly disturbed because they needed something to be disturbed about. Verse 3, and they laid hands on them. We're going to lay hands on Josh tonight. It won't be quite the same. We're going to be a lot more gentle. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> They, they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. Now, Jewish law said that when evening time came, 
you could not put someone on trial. And, and that is kind of funny because just two, three, four weeks earlier, they put Jesus on trial. You know, they, they broke their own law to put Jesus on trial. Now with Peter and John, they, well, let's put them in custody. Let's take them to jail because we don't want to break the law by putting them on trial tonight. So they went back to obeying their law. Um, verse 4, However, many of those who had heard the word believed, and a number of the men came to be about 5,000. So even though these powerful religious and political leaders hated Jesus a lot, um, these, these common folks in the city, when they heard Peter and John preach, they began following Jesus. They began turning their lives over to Jesus. They were repenting of their sins. And I mean, the church is growing extremely fast. And so verse 5, And it came to pass, on the next day, so they have to stay in jail, Peter and John have to stay in jail overnight, that on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes. So, so this, is, this is when the, the, the trial would begin. This is on the next day, and this is when all the questioning would begin. And, and, it, and it's really not a trial like we think of trials today. This was just before... You know, the religious and political leaders, this is the rulers, the elders, and the scribes. These were, in all of Israel, considered to be the brightest, most educated people of their time. And, and, and they were the ones that always asked all the questions, and they decided the punishment. They, they were judge, jury, they, they, were, they were everything. Now, back then, the Jews had basically two religious parties, and those two religious parties could also be divided into two political parties. It, it was just two separate groups, almost two enemies that were willing to come together to go against Jesus. Um, you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, most of the Pharisees, they came from the group called the Scribes. And they, they, were, they were the guardians of the law. They loved the law. They were passionate about the law. They hated the Romans and hated the Roman law and hated the Roman rule. Um, they knew that, that the Romans were evil. They, the Pharisees, they were best known for their high standards of the law, for, for their legalism. They thought, they thought they were smarter and better than everyone else. Everyone else was under them. They did believe in the resurrection. The other party, it was the Sadducees. And they, they controlled the wealth of Israel. They controlled the people of Israel. They owned most of the land in the area. And they worked very, very well with the Roman government. And they realized as long as Rome is in power, we will be in power. And, and they would do anything to maintain all the wealth and control all the people. They did not believe in resurrection. They didn't really think or believe a lot in a spiritual world. They weren't looking for a Messiah because the Messiah would mess up their way of life. And so they, they, they were really the complete opposite of the Pharisees. But these were the two main political players in Israel, and they could control your life, and they could ruin your life with their politics and with their religion. So, the next day that their rulers, elders and scribes, verse 6, as well as Annas the high priest, Annas was not actually the high priest at the time of this um, that this was taking place. Rome had removed him. Rome didn't really care for Annas all that much, but he was, he was very, very powerful. This was a, um, a very, very powerful political family. And so even though, even though he had been removed from power, um, he, he was still called the high priest. His son-in-law was now the high priest. His name was Caiaphas. I'm sure you remember that name. And, and they were just a very, a very, very, very powerful political, 
religious family. And, and as hard as the people tried, they could not get them out of power. They, they, they tried everything, but they could not get them out of power. So these two groups come together to question John and Peter. Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander. I'm assuming John and Alexander were part of the family somehow because it says, and as many were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And so they begin to question Peter and John, verse 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked by what power or by what <clears throat> by what power or by what name have you done this? So, so they bring Peter and John in and they go, What power did you do this? And if you're wondering what they did, we talked about it the past couple of weeks. It's out of um, chapter three here in Acts. This is when Peter and John killed that cripple man. And uh, so they want to know, how did you do this? Who gave you the authority to even do that? And, and by whose name did you heal someone? How, how did all this take place? Verse 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this is good. This is, this is not the old Peter. This, this is not the old loose cannon um, that begins to speak here. This is not the guy that used to act before he thought. This is now Peter, and, and, and it's great that Luke made sure that we knew this is the Peter that is now filled with the Holy Spirit because that makes a difference in our life, right? It should make a difference in, in how we speak and how we act. And so Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, verse 9, if this day, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to this helpless man, by what means he has been made well? So Peter's going, okay, um, just kind of want to be clear here. Are we in trouble because this helpless man was healed? He was crippled and now he can walk. Is that why we're here this morning? Verse 10, Peter continues, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, he throws that in every opportunity to every opportunity he gets. I mean, you have to love Peter. He just preaches the same thing over and over and over again. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, by Jesus, this man stands here before you hope. Now, if you would like, you could circle that word whole, underline that word whole. Um, it means simply healed physically. He, he, his, his physical body has been made well. Then verse 11, this is the stone. And this is a quote from Psalm chapter 118. They knew exactly what Peter was talking about. Um, no one had to explain this to them. Um, when he said, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. They probably cut their eyes. They knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew that he was talking about God's chosen stone. And now they knew that Peter was referring to Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. He's just yelling at them again. He's just really preaching hard at them again. And they don't like it, of course. Verse 12 nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, if you would circle that word saved or underline the word saved, it's very similar in the Greek to that word whole that we just looked at in verse 10, but this time it means healed spiritually, made well spiritually. 
So, so Peter's point was, this man was healed both physically and he was healed spiritually. And, and physical healing without spiritual healing, I mean, we, we would never put down physical healing, but it's just temporary. Without spiritual healing, it's not everything. And, and, if you are here today, if you are here today, and you need a physical healing from God, I pray that you get it. I know that God can. I know that sometimes God wills and God does. But I can't stand here in the pulpit and promise you that He will. I wish I could, but I can't. But if you need a physical healing, I, I pray that you can get it. I just can't promise you that you will. But if you're here today and you call out to God in repentance of your sins and turn to Him and trust Him as your Lord and Savior, I promise you, God will heal you spiritually. You will be saved. I can promise that. And so here's Peter, and, and he's preaching that this man has been healed both physically and spiritually. I mean, he, he boldly preaches that it's only through Jesus. And then verse 13, this is the key verse, this is wonderful. It says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, so the Sadducees, they're, they're listening to Peter, they're listening to John, they're watching them, they see how confident Peter is in his preaching and how bold he is in what he's saying. And look at what it says. And they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were uneducated and untrained. You can underline both of those words because they took notice of that right away. They, they, they noticed... Well, they're not the most educated guys around. They, they certainly hadn't been trained to speak like this. That, that word uneducated in the original language, it means without letters. That means they didn't have a bunch of diplomas. That means that, that they hadn't gone to school to be a preacher. It means they hadn't gone to rabbi school. It doesn't mean that they weren't smart. It just means they didn't have the diploma that the rest of these guys in the room had. They didn't have the same kind of education that these rest of the guys had. doesn't mean they weren't smart. It just means they weren't trained to be rabbis. The next word, untrained, some translations use the word ignorance. Um, in the Greek, it's the um, Greek word Idiostus, idiostus, I think is the way you pronounce it. It's where we get our English word idiot. But it doesn't mean the same thing today that it meant back then. Back then when they used that word, it was just a word to mean they're just plain. I mean, there's nothing special about Peter and John. They're just plain old guys. They are just Simple, ordinary, common, average, typical men. And these Sadducees who thought they were the smartest guys in the room, they were just absolutely astonished by this. Stuck by it. Because they had fallen for the lie that God only does things through brilliant, talented people like us. But of course, nothing could be further from the truth. And they figured it out because look at their conclusion to all of this. Looking at these two untrained, uneducated men, look at what it says. They marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. You know what verse 13 teaches me? God uses simple preachers. 
God, God can use ordinary, common, typical, average people. That's who God uses. God uses us to do amazing things. And that's why the world still looks at us today and marvel at what happens. They marvel at it. And they realize they've been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. That's who God uses. You begin reading through Scripture. I mean, if you would just start in Genesis and read you're going to find that over and over and over that God uses just common, ordinary, typical people. <coughs> you take somebody like Abram, who, who was a pagan living in a land far away, and, and, and God comes to him and says, I'm going to make you the father of nations. Or somebody like Moses, who stuttered every time he spoke. God says, I want you to be my spokesperson. And Moses says, I can't get someone else to speak. And God says, no. You're it. Or you take, you take Elijah and Isaiah, two men who struggled with depression, like many of us do. And, and, and God says, I'm going to use you. These people are famous only because we read about them in the Bible. When, when God used them, they were common ordinary people. They, they, they were just men and women who were living out their life just like we live out our life. They were just trying to make it from this day to this day. They were normal people working hard today so that they could have a better tomorrow. They were normal people who, who lost someone they loved. And they were just, they were just trying to make it day by day. They were just normal people helping their sick elderly parents be able to live day by day. It, they, they, they were just common, average, ordinary people just trying to live life. And that's who God uses. Now, I, I am not in any way saying that God doesn't use the extraordinary people, the well-talented people, the very, very smart people, because He certainly does. He, he used the Apostle Paul, and Paul was everything from just ordinary. I mean, he, he was well-educated. He graduated from the rabbinical school. He was the Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was brilliant. He was well-educated. And God used him. He sent him to the Gentiles to win them to Christ. He used him in prison. He used him to speak to the most famous people of his day. He used Paul to plant and start churches all over the region. But for the most part, God just used ordinary people. Paul realized this, and he said so. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'll start reading in verse 26. Paul just, he, he just comes right out and says it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, For you see, your calling, brethren, your calling is what God has called you to do. It, it, it's your ministry, it's the way that you serve. It's the way that God uses you. It's what God has asked you to do. That's your calling. Your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. That implies intelligence. That, that means the smartest people in the room. The smartest people in the room. So he says, not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many powerful, popular, talented. Not many mighty. Not many noble. That's not 
many wealthy, not, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So, so God's not choosing from the most talented pool or the rich pool or, or the smart pool. He, he's, not, he's not looking for the most popular guy or gal in the room or the smartest guy or gal in the room or the most powerful guy or gal in the room. Instead, verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish. Now, I love that word. That simply means dumb and dull. Dumb and dull. Hey, preacher, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm dumb and dull. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. It's the truth, but it's not so bad. It's not so bad to be dumb and dull. Look at what he says. Because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the shame, the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mine. Love it. Verse 28. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Paul's too smart for us, so I'm, I'm going to sum that up for you. You know what he's saying? He's saying that God chose us. God chose me not because I'm so smart, but because he wanted to choose me, and I'm simple, and I'm dumb, and I'm dull, and I'm okay with that. Because God can do mighty things through the dumb and the dull. And I'm not calling y'all dumb and dull, no. It's just me. Right, Cindy? She shook her head, yes. <laughs> According to what Paul just said, God likes to take common people. Just normal people and do amazing things. Just do things that makes the world go what? What? I don't have a watch. How much time I got? Do you, does anybody know? Do I have time to go through verse 22? I do? How much? <laughs> Go back to Acts chapter 13, or chapter 4. Don't you hate, see, a preacher, we hate it when we can find the clock. <laughs> Y'all don't have one, thank goodness. Don't put one up, Will, on the screen. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. The Sadducees have concluded. And again, this is quite okay, folks. Peter and John, they're not offended by this at all, but they have concluded that Peter and John, they're the dumb and dull of the group. But they have to admit what well, they've been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. Now when they saw the boldness, I'm back in verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, then they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Verse 14, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Of course not. He's standing right there. Your, your eyes couldn't lie. They couldn't deny that at all. Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So they said, Peter and John, would y'all step outside a minute? Just, just go outside. We need to talk this over. Verse 16, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, 
that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident. Even though they're uneducated, they're untrained men, it's evident they've done a mighty thing. You know, so what are we going to do with them? A notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it because you cannot deny what God's doing. It'll be evident to all. Verse 17, But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they decide, let's just put a gag order on Peter and John, tell them not to speak about Jesus anymore. Verse 18, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. So, so, Peter and John, we are judge and jury. And, and you can go. You, you are free to walk out of here, but don't ever talk about Jesus again. Don't, don't ever speak that name again. Just go about your business. Go home. Man, you got lucky this time because we could keep you in jail. But just go home. Forget about this Jesus thing. No more preaching Jesus, and everything will be all right. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, more than to God, you judge. Verse 24, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Peter says, you can make it against the law to preach Jesus if you want to. But I can't stop myself. I have to talk about Jesus. You know, I, I, I just can't stop. I don't care if it's against the law. I don't care what you tell me. You know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be a rebel here, but I can't help myself. I'm going to talk about Jesus. Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Sometimes we get this idea, and early on in the ministry I had this idea, that you have to be the smartest, you have to be the wisest, you have to be the most talented, you can't be just ordinary if you want God to use you in a mighty way. And, and, and if you'll be the smartest and if you'll be the most talented, and then, then everybody will look at you and marvel at you. Well, the Bible teaches just the opposite. The Bible taught that two uneducated, untrained men with Jesus living in them they looked at them and marveled at them, and their only conclusion was they must have been with Jesus. The truth is, it seems to me that God prefers to use ordinary, simple, average people like me and others. That's who he uses. And you know one of the amazing things over the past, and, and I, th I thought about, and I, I have thought about the last, maybe say, 10, 11, 12 months um, that I, I really have gotten to know some of you guys. Um, and I thought about it because of what I'm going to talk about tonight with Josh and the deacons and all that. And I, I was just thinking about what God has done. I don't know if you realize God's done some incredible things here over the past year. It's been amazing through just simple people trying to serve God. That's all it was. Right? And it's amazing. And I'm our Others marvel at it. And it's just simply us being willing for 
God to use us. That's all it takes. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. The invitation is really, really simple this morning. First of all, if you've ever had that thought, well, I don't have any talents, I'm not all that smart, um, you know, I just, I'm just average. I don't know that God can use me. Well, I want you to know you're the prime candidate for God to use. I'm just going to invite you to come and just, just ask God to use you in a mighty way. And he will. But also, we are, we are beginning a new year here at Fox Baptist Church. Um, all the workers are working hard as we kick the new year off. And here's what I want to ask you to do today. I want to ask everyone, everyone that can, I want you to come and get around the altar and pray for this new year and pray for the workers here at Fox. Because the work can get long sometimes. The work can get tiring. Come and pray and just ask that God would take these people and use them in a mighty way. Now, while you're praying, I'm going to get ready for baptism. So don't go home, okay? <laughs> but come and pray that, that, that all these people around you, so many of them, they're, they're working hard as they get ready for the new year. They could use your prayer. So... You come and pray for them. Scott, you come and lead us. <laughs>